and welcome to Confused Reviews, where a cartoon drawing reviews movies, and one strange thing about me is I have a weird love and nostalgia for 70s and 80s action adventure shows, all of which stopped airing decades before I was ever even born. But something fascinating to me is when they decide to make a theatrical, big budget remake years later, some of which I've reviewed already, with mixed results. Then, with as much warning as getting sideswiped, the new revival of a long-forgotten TV series came out of nowhere just to piss me off. 2017's Chips. So, before we jump into this thing, I should probably explain what the hell a Chips is for anyone under the age of 35. Chips, or the California Highway Patrol, Oh, that's why they call it that. Was an action crime show following the escapades of two motorcycle cops who find themselves wrapped up in everything from the mundane to the extremes of law enforcement work. John Baker, played by Larry Wilcox, was the clean-cut, wonderbred Boy Scout who kept a level head and remained mostly serious. Frank Poncherello, however, was a more reckless, charming, and wisecracking fan favorite, played by the one and only Eric Estrada. You'd never know what these two would get into, as it had episodes that were wacky and silly, only to have the next episode deal with serious issues, and it never shied away from real emergencies. Why should I be so tired? We haven't done anything today. That's why, no excitement. The juices aren't flowing. And most importantly, it had awesome highway chase scenes, with almost every episode having one crash involving multiple cars. And just like another one of my favorites, The Dukes of Hazard, this was the 70s and 80s, meaning every single car that crashes in this show was done practically with expert stuntmen. It hasn't held up extraordinarily well, and has its fair share of cheesy moments and downright cringy episodes. But when it got it right, it was really well-made television. I own every single episode, including this pathetic excuse for a final season. Don't even get me started on this. And if you'd like an accurate depiction of how old this show really is, Estrada went on strike during the fifth season and was replaced for seven episodes by Bruce Jenner. It was a different time. So imagine my mix of shock, horror, and confusion when I saw the trailer for a Chips remake in the year 2017, starring Bradley Cooper's friend, Dak Shepard, alongside Michael Pena. I wasn't exactly sure why this was happening, and began to wonder who thought a reboot was needed. And more importantly, if anyone even remembered this TV show from 40 years back. I tried remaining optimistic, even though the trailers weren't very reassuring. There's no way to track this guy. Why don't you scan his face? We don't have a fucking bat computer. Right. Just Google. Cheese. But we'll get to that stuff soon enough. Chips tells the story of an FBI agent going undercover within the CHP to try to figure out the mystery of whether some generic bad guys are actually dirty cops, and he teams up with a moronic newbie, and the two just can't seem to get along as they find themselves getting into scene after scene of audio-visual torture. So now that you're at least partially up to speed, let's jump back to Dak Shepard for a minute. This man is almost entirely responsible for every creative decision made in this movie. For reference, Dak starred as the lead role, wrote the screen play solo, was an executive producer, did most of his own stunts, and directed the entire thing alone. So did Frito manage to pull it all off, or was this another instance of a passion project going horribly wrong? Chip Happens is the worst movie tagline I've ever read. It doesn't even make sense. How did they take shit and morph it into chips? Well, actually, that's exactly what they did. I wouldn't be shocked if at one point they pitched, I'm getting too old for this chip as an option. Oh, and I figured I'd just get this low-hanging fruit joke out of the way. This is chips. So the movie begins with a disclaimer stating that the actual CHP had no hand in the disaster that awaits. Or in other words, they're looming us up before the fuck. We cut to the classic morning routine montage of Michael Pena, who plays Agent Castillo. By the way, Ponch, the most recognizable character from the original series, doesn't exist. Or at least in this movie, because instead it's a fake alias. Which is a really out there decision, but it's merely the tip of this shit-coated iceberg. John Baker, played by Dax Dax Revolution, is shown to be the complete polar opposite of his well-adjusted FBI counterpart. Oh, and he's also... Shit. Very clumsy, it seems, but not as clumsy as this editing. Hey yo! We pop into the beginning of Baby Driver as we see the agent acting as a getaway driver to criminals wearing masks ripped right out of a backyard wrestling ring. 
He also proves to be a pretty slick driver, which will not only be completely ignored for the rest of the movie, but they make their way to the docks from GTA 5, and after a quick vehicle swap, he decides now's a good time to call in backup. Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv? Tel Aviv, what, what the fuck is Tel Aviv? Oh. Is this guy the dumbest criminal to ever grace the earth? Anyone who's ever seen one single episode from any crime show ever knows saying some random nonsense into a jacket collar is a clear sign of someone wearing a wire. Anyways, the dipshit also gets really offended after finding out this information. I took you on vacation to the Bahamas with my family. You made me this friendship bracelet. But since we have to try and make this lead likable, yeah, but that backflip though. he tries holding Adam Brody hostage, and I'm sure it'll end in a nice bit of heroic angst. Oh my god! So not only does this opening scene have horrendous editing that makes vlogs whipped up in Windows Movie Maker look artsy, not only does it manage to make Michael Pena's character immediately unlikable and pompous, but best of all, it establishes he's quite the ladies' man. Look at this! Your wife. Um, sure. I bet that won't come back up several more times. We then hop over to see John's training, or lack thereof. And even though it seems like he's as useful as a police officer as Helen Keller hogtied, he can do some wicked motorcycle tricks. So I guess that's all it takes. Sergeant Hernandez, portrayed by an uncredited Maya Rudolph, explains that he's absolutely and without a doubt a terrible candidate to be seriously considered, but ah, what the hell, and she gives him a shot anyway. The only actually useful thing to remember is that his right shoulder has a metal plate in it. His right shoulder. We'll get back to that later. Over on the highway, a group of masked bikers infiltrate a money truck, but instead of establishing the villains as interesting or threatening, Chips alternatively chooses to go right ahead and use the most cliche trope in all of cop cinema. Some of those involved are dirty cops. I've never seen that used before. Well done. We see the ringleader is that of Vincent D'Onofrio, who not only sheds and regains give or take 50 pounds in between shots, but also he suffers from a severe case of bad ADR. What are you doing, man? You and TJ skipped 200 grand off the last job. You think I wouldn't notice? So just to wrap up this gloriously bad scene, he gives another crooked officer an ultimatum, that one of them must perish. So the guy in the helicopter just fucking jumps out. TJ! <laughs> That has got to be the funniest sacrifice scene I've ever seen in my life. We know nothing about the three men, what they've done, or really who's who, and before long, one of them kamikazes to the ground without explaining anything. Moving on, Isaiah Whitlock Jr., who plays the run-of-the-mill. Angry, black captain. It ain't nothing but a stupid stereotype. And it goes back and forth with no real finesse, until we reach a conclusion I can convey in one sentence. Poncharello is a codename that he hates. You're gonna be Francis Llewellyn Poncharello. That's a fucked up name. And the asshole is going undercover. Now that we're 20 minutes in, we can finally have John and Ponch meet, and instead of it being a funny or action-packed scene establishing some kind of bond or chemistry between the two dudes that will have to hold up the movie until the end, we get a strangely embarrassing scene of Ponch not only coming off like a massive prick to John, but also the fact that they go on forever babbling about Baker getting too clingy too fast, and the cherry on top of all of it is whatever this was meant for. It's as exciting as water torture, and I'd prefer to move along. Move along. Move along. Orson Welles has a rundown with some art collector snob that makes Ongo Gablogian look credible. I only mention this because the movie never really continues this plot thread of them smuggling expensive paintings to somewhere. And that's because the other scenes with an actual antagonist motivation fell victim to the cutting room floor. We bounce to a briefing where we see the captain is actually played by Jane Kaczmarek. And now that I think of it, any line of Lois dialogue from Malcolm the Middle perfectly sums up how I feel watching this movie. I have had it! Oh, and John also bakes himself out to be a total buffoon. Because comedy. They get let loose, and we get a riveting exchange with Officer Perez, played by Rosa Silzar. They lazily set her up as the future love interest, but considering she's about to vanish for most of the runtime, I figure I'd at least make her existence known for later. At least she gets one thing for sure. No one wants to hear about your marriage troubles, okay? For how self-aware it is, they're really gonna keep coming back to that well. Ponch tries smooth-talking the rest of the department, who are all eating at the same diner at the same time somehow, and Ray Kurtz is revealed to not only be the flick's main antagonist from earlier, but in what feels like a rushed afterthought, throws in the fact that he's also a cop. How could we possibly slow down for a minute to give this revelation a dramatic reveal or a minute to breathe? It really cut into this tired fucking joke screen time. Ahahahaha! <laughs> 
They head over to the house of the recently departed skydiving enthusiast, whose wife Joy, played by Marin Dungey, also starred as Kitty Canarbin in Malcolm in the Middle. Guest Chips is secretly a reunion film. Ponch desperately tries getting the 411 on the officer, but an exposition dump would be far too boring, so instead it's supplemented with John getting grossed out from cat buttholes in a crock pot that I can only imagine is cooking up something fierce. What's even better about this horribly awkward display is that seconds after he leaves the room, Ponch just wraps it up. You'd think in a more competently written script, this would be the moment where the widow starts getting real with the more serious detective, now that this jackhole is gone. No, because outside, John used his Sherlock-level deducing skills to conclude that the wife moved on super quickly, as within a month of death, all traces of his existence have vanished from the house, and his lack of tools and guns. There's no tools? And no gun safe? What cop doesn't have a gun safe? It's just weird. You check the house for less time than the cop's theme song runs. It could be in the shed, basement, or in fucking storage. Why don't they take more time to investigate this obviously fishy scenario and maybe- Feels like he didn't live there. Bro, I gotta hit the Arby's at the bottom of the hill, man. Oh, okay, guess we're moving on. A full half hour in, we finally start getting some actual highway action as we see an old guy driving like a maniac while singing in a moment ripped right out of License to Drive. The laughs don't stop as John acts like a frantic maniac and arrests the jerk off, meaning the old fart will probably miss golf today. Oh, and since I have no clean way of inserting this tidbit into the review, might as well just lay it on here. This gal, Officer Taylor, is played by an actress with the name Jessica McName. And the only reason I'm mentioning her at all is because that has got to be the best name of all time. She does nothing even remotely resembling substance, and I believe has a whopping five lines in the whole movie, but she's also apparently playing Sonya Blade in an upcoming Mortal Kombat reboot. Back to the movie, we see John visiting his ex-wife Karen, played by Kristen Bell. She serves as eye candy, and, well, that's actually the end of the list. You know, it was my first day, so I thought you'd probably want to... See what I look like. In all brown? So I guess you could say the Chip's uniform is... stale? <laughs> What's so frustrating is that the saving the wife plotline isn't even really needed for John's character. Listen, I have one shot at saving my marriage. No one wants to hear about your marriage troubles, okay? because it would be just as good if his sole purpose was trying to prove himself to the rest of the CHP, because they set up that he was once a renowned writer who isn't fit for the job. Cut out all the pointless wife crap, that's just a reason to have Dax's wife in the movie, and instead make the big bust be the trial run for John, which would make or break his position as a cop. In regards to what we got instead, yeah, you know, it could have been worse. <clears throat> Hell yeah. What? Was he really just proud of the dump he just took? What a weird thing to leave in the movie. Especially if you dive into the deleted scenes, it confirms what he was actually doing. And then about like 30 to 45 minutes ago, I beat the fuck out of my dick so goddamn hard. I'm honestly not sure which one is worse. They drone on and on like an old married couple fighting over the TV remote about, you can't make this shit up, whether Ponch needs to get medicine for his chronic shitting. Oh, somebody kill! Please. The bad guys rob another armored truck, and we see Ray's son Jr., played by Justin Chatwin. You might recognize Goku here from that unholy abortion of a Dragon Ball movie, or more positively, as Jimmy Steve from Shameless. Which is ironic that they didn't take any notes from that show when trying to balance raunchy humor and forced sentimentality. <laughs> And the amateur editing continues, with scenes ending mid-shot. Did Edward Scissorhands cobble this mess together? John, if you haven't been fucking your wife in over a year, then somebody else has. This motherfucker! Like, who's been fucking your wife? Okay, so when doing a buddy cop comedy and action flick, when all else fails, the whole movie has nothing else going for it. At least get the chemistry of the two main stars correct. Chips does not. Whether Pena and Shepard were actually buddies in real life before or after this movie is all fine and good, but what we get in the film in terms of a relationship is about as stable as train tracks made out of styrofoam. Let's look at three perfect examples of doing a buddy cop movie correctly. Lethal Weapon, Hot Fuzz, and The Nice Guys. Three movies with the same basic skeleton, but all manage to innovate and impress while adding new flavor that spans different decades, professions, and even countries. All three have a pair of characters with near polar opposite personalities and morals who just can't seem to get it together until eventually making peace and teaming up. In 
interesting plot that has different twists and turns that lead to a satisfying climax, snappy dialogue that is quotable as hell. Raj, meet your new partner. Oh, I'm too old for this shit. Point Break or Bad Boys 2? Which one do you think I prefer? No, I mean which one do you want to watch first? Why don't we invite him in? No animals in the house, sweetheart. And most importantly, by the end, you actually give a shit about the characters to the point where you want them to succeed. After all, they are supposed to be the goddamn heroes. Again, Chips manages to check off none of those boxes, but most depressing is that even after the movie eventually tries forcing you into thinking they're buddies and to root for them, it feels so awkward and staged. And I don't buy into their friendship one bit. It also doesn't help that they have paper-thin personalities that blur throughout the movie, because they both need to play the funny one. Hell, End of Watch, another cop movie with Michael Pena in it, managed to do the genre more justice, with way less money. Did I mention this movie has a $25 million budget? What? You'd never know because of how boring all the shots look, but it's true somehow. Another chase is underway, and after giving some of the taxpayers a few new blind spots, we get what is quite possibly the only mildly funny joke in the entire movie. John and Ponch, what's your 20? I'm northbound! Ponch is southbound! For a half second there, this almost resembled a comedy. They eventually crash into a makeshift county fair with, is that Newman from The Boys? Hello, Newman. <laughs> and John ravages the festivities with backup blues mobiles. Also, it was nice to find out that the stunt was done for real by strapping ramps to the front of the cruisers to create this effect. The two sides drop in, with John eventually blasting at the bad guys, but forgets he has the aim of a stormtrooper and rather hits a bullseye. That's probably the second worst thing that could happen in a dunk tank. <laughs> Also, the original show had a dunk tank scene. Wonder if anyone knew that beforehand. They continue onto the highway, but the California love is at an all-time low, as Baker realizes his state issued bike has no chance of catching the speed demons, and they escape into the T-1000's favorite racetrack. And for no reason whatsoever, a negligent truck driver almost kills Ponch, who John saves in the nick of time, from the truck just crushing and killing him, only for the truck to fucking explode! <laughs> Yes, it literally comes out of nowhere and is forgotten as soon as it happens. At least John proves paybacks a bit. <laughs> we then get a great scene showing that Ponch is a real Casanova, because Eric Estrada was a huge heartthrob back in the day. So we see the first of a frightening amount of women throwing themselves at this pudgy goofball. Eh, sure, I'll buy it. Springing to the next day, a thunderstorm is brewing. It's filmed with as much cadence as a soap opera, churning out a mind-boggling situation. John, due to the weather, is paralyzed or super stiff. I don't fucking know, I'm not a doctor. But he lies on the ground completely nude and manages to get Poncherello to come assist. He chops down the breath mints the crew put in those pill bottles and begs his partner to lift him naked and place him in the bathtub. Not only is this probably the worst situation you could find yourself in with a new co-worker, if your name isn't Monica, and he attempts to carry John into the bathroom. It fails miserably, and John is flung across the room like a shampoo bottle falling off the shelf. But in a move I can't say I've ever seen done anywhere else in this way, they already censored his... Mini Dax. Like reality TV pixelated blur. I'm obviously covering it more, so you'll just have to take my word for it. I'm sure it was to get past censors, or just because who wants their junk immortalized in full HD and head-on for this pile of shit. This whole bit seems like it was an idea Dax had, and then maybe wasn't feeling too great about the scene when it came time to shoot. Then again, I don't know. Thankfully, they both laugh it off, and we can move on. No, not from the bathroom, that'd be silly. Ponch decides, while his still butt-ass naked, pill-popping partner is in the bath, that now's the perfect opportunity to reveal that he's FBI, and what the next clue is. He reacts with this Oscar-worthy face, and that's all in terms of Baker reacting. I'm not even kidding. The two then check out the apartment of the helicopter pilot that kicked this story into gear. He planned on sharing this humble abode with this dude from earlier, who he was also having an affair with. They run over these riveting facts using a filter that looks like a horrible Wild West TV movie. Even making it black and white would have looked better. And since this plot is moving at the pace of a car with four flat tires, we go back to the dead adulterating police officer's wife's house, where we get the most hilariously bad editing in the whole film. We need your help to see who that could be. I see you run this house again, I will be in your ass with a boot. 
I didn't doctor that footage at all. We actually got a freeze frame gag reminding the audience of an exchange I didn't mention earlier, where the dead cop's partner threatens Ponch to not come back over. I half expected this to happen directly after. Motherfucker! Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. A decent enough fight scene ensues with the Three Stooges wrecking everything in the house, ending with John somehow knocking out this huge dude with some thin paintings. Maybe it was just a happy little accident. They move the conversation to the car outside so that Officer Parrish, played by Richard T. Jones, can show these two morons the answer to the mystery a sloth could have figured out. There's more than one LT? You mean Lieutenant? The first time I saw this movie, I was genuinely shocked that these two men in law enforcement, one of which being in the FBI, didn't realize that LT was the abbreviation for Lieutenant. Even Kelso knew more than that. They then use the iPad X Machina to pinpoint the bad guy without a moment's hesitation. And after a quick bike upgrade and dick jokes that fall flat, the movie gifts me with these terrible outfits. And these members of Cobra, Blue Beetle, Nightwing wannabes, discount Blue Power Ranger dipshits make their way to the gym to see Raymond is lifting what looks like an impressive 350. <laughs> Safe to say, Private Pyle is fucking yoked, and as soon as things start to heat up with Kurt standing his ground on Ponch's cockiness, they just leave. They were so close to a good scene. So close. Anywho, we arrive to the worst exchange in cinematic history. Real talk? She ate my butt. Now for the life of me, I'll never understand who approved of this bit that goes on for 10,000 hours and the secondhand embarrassment radiating off these lines that make the American Pie sequels look like fine art. Did she ate your ass? Did you eat hers? Of course. Of course. Oh what God. are you talking about? Dude, that's, that's standard. Everyone's eating everyone's ass now. There is no way everybody's eating everyone's, everyone's ass. Eating no, everyone's eating everyone's ass. It's impossible. Ass. Everyone is not eating everyone's they ass. They are. And they were extremely proud of it, to the point where it takes up a good chunk of the trailer. If you go to the bathroom and you see some baby wipes, green lights. Move out of the way, George Carlin, step aside Dave Chappelle, and rid your mind of Bill Burr, because this is comedy. The crunchy cops make chase with Ray's son, tearing up a mall like the Blues Brothers, and John manages to catch him. Oh, and he still can't shoot for shit, so Red starts going after Blue, and Kurtz happens to have a huge fucking SWAT truck that he uses to kill Walter White. But more importantly is that this random tow truck that continues to flip over this car, all while being two feet away from a whole squadron of cop cars, causes Ray Sun to just get fucking decapitated. No, that wasn't a clip from Final Destination 5. This minor character that we know fuck all about gets his head popped off and it's meant to be an emotional moment. But yeah, John nearly gets killed and we go through the motions and you know exactly how it ends. Hey. Wow, I was so scared for him and I really thought they might pull a Johnny Cade and just have him die. Bullshit. And like I said, the ladies are gushing over Ponch, and we get a gut buster of a scene where he accidentally starts sexting the captain. But again, Malcolm in the Middle did it years ago. Could you, you know, maybe put a top on? They're just boobs, lady. You see them in the mirror every morning, and I'm sure yours are a lot nicer than mine. We get the obligatory firing scene with some... Instead of looking at all this juicy L.A. booty they got out here, things wouldn't be so bad. Colorful vocabulary. And they try tacking on some sympathetic themes in the 11th hour, with Ponch reminding the audience that John was once some hotshot biker, and proclaims that the reason Baker won't shut the fuck up about his ex-wife is that he's holding on to the past. It doesn't really matter, and is done really sloppily. While we're on the topic of poorly done scenes, we see Edgar suit up, as well as kidnap Karen from whatever one-star hotel they film this at. No time for that, as Ponch has to go see Lindell and continues to play with her emotions, but eventually convinces her to swear him in. One dollar store version of Mission Impossible Rogue Nation later, and Ray catches up to them, acting less like Maniac Cop and more like the later Police Academy sequels. They both manage to find and enter the crack house, some easier than others. Come on, Uncle okay? You got this, man! You can make it! I didn't make it! And Ray is hot on their tail. Ponch also suffers a True Grit inspired finger loss. Meanwhile, John has to cast fight his doppelganger. I mean, seriously, he looks 50% Dax, 25% Beck Bennett, and 100% as useless as he was in the Friday the 13th remake. Ow! 
But to begin wrapping up, we get honestly the only thing that is established and paid off correctly, and John finally manages to hit something on target, and takes out the crook by blasting some explosive picture frames. But again, no time to think about that, because we get not one, but two randomly placed Back to the Future references. Where we're going, we don't need doors. Roads? Where we're going, we don't need doors. I even found this ad with the rehashed line on it. I don't get the connection. Hey. Hey, I've seen this one. I've seen this one. This is a classic. And just when I thought to myself, there's no way, no possible chance that they could make the apex of the story any worse than what we've already seen. And then, this happened. On the surface, this may seem like just another convenient end to an action movie, but every single aspect of this moment is wrong. So fundamentally inept in every conceivable fashion that it could realistically fuel an entire episode on its own. So let's break it down. 1. The Mexican standoff ends with Ponch leaping towards John in what I assumed would be the diving in front of the bullet moment, but instead it's just him tackling John like at a youth football game. Why didn't they have Ponch take one for his partner, completing his non-existent arc of being heroic instead of the total dickhole he's been the whole movie? 2. If Ray was even a tiny bit good at his role of a bad guy, he would have taken the shot at one of them as soon as this bimbo gave him the gun. It's even less believable because unlike John McClane would do, they don't even try bargaining or distracting him. They both just look at him like lost puppies. How did Kingpin get duped by the dumbest comedy duo since Biodome? 3. The CGI blood from both ends looks horrendous. 4. I'm fairly confident in saying that this shot was bought on some shady website and wasn't done for the film. It just looks like it was originally meant to be alongside some gun sound effects. Who knows, maybe I'm wrong. 5. I love this overdramatic head flail he does after getting shot. Now that's acting. 6. In something so stupid it's ripped right out of Halloween Resurrection, another deleted scene show that Ray wasn't actually dead from a bullet directly in between his eyes. Because he really had a metal plate in his forehead. Good riddance. 7. And the biggest problem that, when I explain it, should seem so elementary that it's almost comedic how this went overlooked. The metal plate in John's arm that helped cascade the bullets back into Ray's fucking face is actually the other arm. That's what I was talking about earlier when I said to remember that John's right arm has the metallic enhancement, because they somehow completely shit the bed and did it wrong. How did they not only miss it, but not even try and hide it by either flipping the images, move some lines around, or easier than all that, just pay the fuck attention. So anyways, the laziest villain death of all time is over and done with, and John finally tells Anna to fuck off and go make Frozen 3 after she wanted nothing to do with him the whole flick. Nah, I'm good. You're kind of a dick. I'm gonna ride with Punch. Well, well, well. How the turntables... And as he's taken away in the end of the movie super ambulance that has treated many of your favorite movie characters throughout the years... Hey, that's looking really awful. You want some morphine? Holy shit, is that Eric Estrada, acclaimed actor from Oscar-winning masterpiece Cool Cat Saves the Kids? That I just so happen to have the complete box set for, as well as a signed page of the script from visionary director Derek Savage? You bet, as half of the original aviator-loving duo has a cameo in the home stretch of this thing as a paramedic in the back of the ambulance. I'd be completely full of shit if I said I didn't get excited when I saw Estrada show up when I first saw this in the theater. That being said, this cameo has since been spoiled for me because of my newfound knowledge around it. Taking a look back to the movie's premiere, Dax thanked two people who he said made the film possible. Eric Estrada, and instead of the expected answer of Larry Wilcox, Shepard instead thanked Michael Pena. Which is a bit odd, but then got the gears turning as to whether John Baker's actor was approached to be in the film, or if he had any involvement. Turns out he not only had zero input in the movie, but he wasn't even asked to be a part of it. That seems pretty scummy to me, especially considering the long history of bullshit Larry had to deal with when he owned the rights to the Chips brand, and the several previous attempts made to make a Chips movie. I mean, come on, you guys didn't even offer? I can get the guy in this review. Hey Dax, uh, this is Larry Wilcox. I used to star in a television series called Chips, and I understand that uh, you've gone through something rough. 
I just want you to know to keep your chin up and uh, good luck. That was the best money I've ever spent for this show. Finally, John scores with the chick who played Alita, and we get a great reaction template from both generations of Ponch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you too, yeah, huh? Yeah, okay. be, be classy. Be yeah, classy. Yeah, yeah. yeah, always classy. With one last eating ass joke for the road. And if it wasn't enough of a slap in the face, the closing credits show a montage that actually looked enjoyable and showed some humility from the leads. Glad that's what they decided to not have in the movie to leave room for all the other random bullshit that wasn't funny. And that was Chips, and Dax's Hot Ones interview perfectly sums up my thoughts. Damn it! My sauce was Fuck! <laughs> Blazing through the things that were good in this movie won't take very long, but here it goes. Michael Pena is naturally funny, and while sorely miscast, which we'll get to, he was still handed a weak script with nothing to work with. But he at least makes the movie watchable when he's on screen, and not acting like a total dick. Also, I know I've been ragging on Dax Shepard pretty hard throughout this review, but from everything I've seen, both on camera and in interviews, he seems like a genuinely good guy, and him and his wife are one of the only celebrity couples that doesn't make me cringe into oblivion when I see them. You know who I'm talking about. Plus, again, he reportedly did most of his own stunts, including this awesome stoppy during the training montage. And I must admire his commitment to doing the stunts in this movie practically, and it doesn't go all taken three with the cuts. For that, I tip my cap to you, sir, because you know me. I love me some good practical effects over any kind of bland CGI mess, including when it's done here. So, taking that into account, the margins start to kind of even out. I'd also like to discuss casting really quick. Now, I don't know shit about how casting works in Hollywood or how who gets what role, but these two were not the right choices. Michael Pena is a truly great actor, and his work in other movies is what makes me feel that way. But having someone like Uino Derbez, Diego Luna, or hell, even John Leguizamo would have made the constant gag of every woman throwing themselves at Ponch feel less like a straight-up parody. And with John Baker, the believability is practically nothing. He is the all-American Boy Scout, not the radical extreme biker dude who was in the X Games or some shit. The guy was a goddamn war hero, not some pathetic wash-up who couldn't catch a fish in a coffee cup. And I think Ryan Gosling, Dan Stevens, or Aaron Eckhart could have given John Baker a worthy resurgence. But maybe this is just fan casting at this point. I think another huge problem was that Shepard wore too many hats during production. Dax seems like a charismatic guy with comedic chops, and has been great in other projects, but I think he spread himself a little too thin in trying to do everything. Mind you, film is a hugely collaborative and stressful effort, and Dax decided to star as the lead, write the entire screenplay, finance the movie as an executive producer, and direct the entire thing by himself, along with the other stuff. Shit, did he do makeup and pick up coffee every morning for everyone too? Some people can create great works of art while being mostly a one-man band, but Dax was just not equipped to helm a movie of this size alone, and it fails in just about every aspect. Which is unfortunate, because as cheesy and silly as the original show was, seeing a duo with actual chemistry set alongside more action like this, <laughs> Holy shit! and less like this, and I feel like Chips could have actually been a hit. Instead, it turned out to be a sad limp across the finish line. Doing a raunchy comedy with Highway Officers has been done well before, with Super Troopers, but here it just feels like a mix of not being the right source material coupled with a lack of vision and proper execution. And this is coming from an asshole who didn't completely hate the revival of Baywatch. Plus, with a bad comedy, it's easy to just keep mentioning how it isn't funny, and as scapegoatish as that is, it's definitely true here. Every joke is either dead on arrival or is continued for so long that it runs itself into the ground. I'm not sure how much or if any of these garbage lines were ad-libbed, but at certain points I feel like I was watching a shitty Judd Apatow venture, and don't even get me started on the god-awful editing in this movie. Scenes just randomly end mid-shot, they're some of the worst ADR I've ever seen in a big-budget movie, has dogshit continuity across the board, and doesn't do anything fresh with the practical effects that the crew worked really hard to pay off. And surprisingly, the most shocking part of this whole editing rant is that the editor for this movie has worked on legitimately large projects, some of which are actually pretty good. So were they just in a rush, off their game that day? I need answers, dammit.
All in all, looking at a bag of potato chips for an hour and 40 minutes would be more exciting and funnier than this movie. Aside from some well done stunt work and a few nose exhale level jokes, this movie is nothing. It manages to fail in every way it can and is a chore to sit through. I can't say I expected much from a 2017 Chips reboot, but this wound up being worse than any Arby's fueled nightmare I could have ever dreamt up. I gotta hit the Arby's at the bottom of the hill, man. I'm going to give Chips... This one might be the worst remake of a classic action show, which is a pretty low bar in terms of quality. It's only entertaining when you examine all of the rookie mistakes and mediocre choices made from start to end. But now that this exists and will never go away, I'll try and keep my head up until they announce the next one of these worthless remake turds. Skip this one, as not only is the original series more fun to watch, but with all the great buddy cop pictures out there, this isn't one to waste your time with. I'm Confused Reviews. She ate your ass? Yeah. Oh, fuck off. Thanks for watching.